Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, we're going to get off to a very prompt start because we have a very full panel today. Um, I should note that if you're looking at the printed uh, schedule, it's not correct anymore. Um, we actually have uh, a lineup of four, uh, so we're going to go 20-minute segments. Um, if they finish a little early, I'm going to keep everybody on very strict time, but if they finish a little early, we'll do questions during that slot. Otherwise, we'll do a few, have, hopefully have time for some questions at the end. Um, our lineup is first, we have uh, Julia Forbes, Head of Museum in Interpretation, and Nicole Cromarty, uh, Coordinator of Museum Interpretation at the High Museum. And they're going to be talking about the art clicks. Um, Bruce, followed by Bruce Wyman, Director of Creative Development at Second Story. Uh, followed by Emily Black, Interpretive Plan Planner of Digital Media at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. And Scott Sayre, our invisible Scott Sayre, who's currently presenting in another room for the first half and then will be making his way in here, <coughs> who's the principal at Sandbox Studios. Um, so without further ado, I give you Julia Forbes and Nicole. <laughs> Okay. I mess it up. Okay. okay. Can I move it slightly lower? Not mess with the system. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, we're really excited to share our new app, Art Clicks, with you all today. I want to recognize Bruce Wyman, who's following us, because Second Story was our developer on this app. So I know, Bruce, if I say something wrong, you'll correct me in your session. And I also want to recognize Pat Rodewall, the Director of Education at The High, who, of course, was a major part of developing the app as well. So, Pat, you'll tell us later, I guess, if we say something wrong, or you'll jump in. Um, well, we're really excited to share it to you. How many people had a chance to join us at The High last night for the reception? Oh, fantastic. And I hope lots of you had an opportunity to download Art Clicks. It's a free download on your iPhone or from the Android Marketplace and had a chance to use it. I'll apologize if our Wi-Fi was misbehaving a little bit last night, but I hope you had a good experience. So we're going to quickly take you through. Um, so I'm going to nod to Nicole when she's supposed to click. Okay. You can just do that too. Okay. I can do it myself. Got it. <laughs> That's right. Um, so we started thinking about the idea of having an app probably about 18 or 19 months ago. And one of the first things we did was gather together a group of people in Atlanta, um, some of our friends like Bruce and Nancy and um, some folks here in town at Georgia Tech's Interactive Media Technology Center, and just brainstorm with them about what an app might be. We really wanted to do something that was, number one, interpretive. So in a gallery exhibition, we wanted it to engage our audience, and it was part of an initiative that we had to engage engage a younger audience. This was a, a larger institutional initiative at the high to engage a younger audience. So those were some very early goals we had for developing the app. And out of this great day in July of 2010, we came out with, we had stickies all over the wall, and it was a great meeting. And we boiled it down to kind of three approaches that we thought we could take. One was bookmarking, and for us that meant the idea, a very old-fashioned idea, that people often buy a postcard when they're at the museum, and they take those postcards home with them, and they remember the experience of being at the museum, and so that was something we wanted to try to create. There was this idea of questions and answers. For us, that meant a two-way conversation, visitors talking to each other, visitors talking with the museum. That was something we wanted to try to achieve. And the third was understanding the information in the show, and so we kept thinking about, well, what, what way might that happen? But there needed to be a bit of interpretive content as a part of this app, so that was something that we really wanted to make happen. We were very excited with those three concepts when we came out of that meeting. Within about three weeks, we went to our director, presented to him the idea that we wanted to do this in an app format. We wanted to hire a second story. We were very excited to work with them. He gave us the go-ahead to do that at that point. And um, very quickly after that, I went off to London to the Tate Handheld Conference where I had a chance to actually meet probably lots of you in the room and test out a lot of these ideas. I know I talked to a lot of, of folks at that conference about this and learned a lot and got very excited that we were on a good path and that um, somehow in, in integrating the idea of social media into this app was going to be something that was going to really make a, a big difference. We knew we had a big problem. We didn't have Wi-Fi, so we did have to make the investment to install Wi-Fi in our special <coughs> exhibition galleries. That was a big effort that had to happen almost immediately when I got back from London. And we had a lot of conversations I did with lots of you all about, wow, should we have our own devices that people rent? Should people use their own devices? We had this relationship with Antenna. There was a lot of conversation. And in the end, what we decided, and I'm pretty happy with the decision, is that we were going to develop something for smartphone users. So people were going to use their own devices, people who already knew how to use that device. And that was something that we started with going forward. There's second story slide. That's your nod, Bruce. 
So we engage Second Story, and um, we developed a really great internal team at the high, and we wanted it to be cross-divisional. That was very important to us. So you can see we had education, marketing, our social media folks. We had our registrar. Image rights is a very big deal, and happy to talk about that later, but um, that's, that's a challenge. Our curatorial and our graphic design team. So we really <coughs> tried to engage a lot of areas of the museum, and we had almost weekly meetings starting in December of 2010, right through till we launched in October of um, 2011. Right. Mm -hmm. So in the end, these were the goals um, for our app. So I'll, I'll let you, you know, read those yourself. But the one that I really want to raise up to you is the fourth one, because this is something that I think very importantly Second Story brought to this app that I think is really special about it. Um, this idea of bookmarking, the idea of a postmark, we had a postcard, sorry, was something that we had had in our mind from that early meeting in July. We kept thinking people would be able to take a picture and maybe it would be a branded picture. Allegra, we were very inspired, of course, by what you all had done on your app at most with a branded picture. We were very excited about that. And as we began to talk to Bruce and his team, they were saying, well, what if we used photo recognition software and that photo, the taking of the photograph, actually became a magical way to kind of deliver the content. And that was a very important turning point for us in the development of the app. And those of you maybe who had a chance to use it last night, I hope got to experience some of that, which we found really an exciting part of it. So the experience in the end came to be, you can take, there are three ways to access the content. Nicole's going to take you through that um, very specifically here in a moment. And there's the opportunity to, so that, that's our, um, the photograph kind of became our bookmarking element, right? And then the um, idea that you could talk with one another and with the museum is all uh, part of our social media element that you can Twitter and Facebook and send an email, share in a community. And then there's also a little bit of content and the 27 audio stops that are part of our regular tour. So that's the, really the core of what's in the app and I think really meets these goals that I have up on the screen. We are very big on measurables at the high and so that's something that we really wanted to have a good list of. So being able to track downloads was something that's important to us and we're able to do that. Um, as of Monday, we had 2,851 downloads and I hope after last night we're well over 300. Uh, so I hope lots of you downloaded. Um, we can track the postcards sent in these, these emails that are sent, we refer to as postcards, the number of postcards view. We're watching our own Facebook and Twitter followers to see if encouraging them to participate in this activity increases our followers. And our goal is that about 10% of our visitors will be ArtClick users, and that's 10% of the visitors to the Picasso to Warhol show. As of last week, we're at about 5%, so we still have a lot of work to do, but I think we're getting close. So I'm going to turn it over to Nicole. Dance. Thank you. This is the point at which I joined the Art Clicks team. <laughs> uh, the exciting part of choosing the name and what is the name meant to do? <laughs> we defined three goals for our name. We didn't want the name of the app to be about the Picasso to Warhol exhibition. Rather, we wanted it to be about the experience of the app. Um, we wanted it to be something that could stay with the app and be used for other exhibitions. Um, we also wanted something that would be catchy in the iTunes store and the Android market. Um, we discussed these goals with the Second Story team. Um, we had an internal brainstorming session, which is the photo that you <laughs> see here. Um, and we sent some of the finalists, which you can also see, you view, frame up, I see. Um, there are a few others. Um, that we discussed with Second Story, and in the end, we chose the title Art Clicks. Uh, we thought it was catchy, it didn't already exist anywhere that we could find, <laughs> and we liked the sort of triple meaning of it. Um, art Clicks with a Q, like groups talking together. Art Clicks, like a camera. Um, and Art Clicks, uh, like a light bulb flash, like I get it. <clears throat> so that was exciting for us, and then we were off. Um, hopefully most of you have seen the way that the app actually looks, um, but these are the three ways that Julia mentioned that you can access the same information. And this is dependent on whether you're in the gallery with a camera, in the gallery with a device that doesn't have a camera, or not in the gallery. So if you look to the left, you can photograph in the gallery the artwork, which will bring up the information. If you are not in the gallery, you have the list view in the middle where all of the artworks are listed and you can select to get the same information. And then on the right, if you're in the gallery without a camera, you can enter in an ArtClicks pin, which you may have seen on the wall last night is just sort of like an audio guide number that you would see next to an artwork. And this is what you will see. This is the information that you access. 
On the left, you will see, that's actually me <laughs> posing with this Matisse. Um, you will see that if you take a picture to access the artwork, your image that you took will appear with the information, or if you access it via a keypad or the list function, the official image, when available, will appear <laughs> with the artwork information. <laughs> uh, this screen shows you um, the uh, login for the profile login, which you're prompted to do only if you decide to share a work of art, um, either via Twitter, Facebook, or email. We decided very early on that we didn't want to bombard users with logins for Facebook and Twitter and email and a unique profile for the app. So this is only requested uh, once you try to share an artwork. This is a couple views of our community screen um, in which users can talk to each other in the exhibition or with high staff. Um, what we hoped would happen is, mm -hmm. much like Facebook, that users would comment and then they would comment on each other. Up until last night when we had <laughs> MCN users in the galleries, um, this wasn't really happening. People are commenting, they are commenting on the artwork, which is great. We haven't had to remove anything that was unrelated or offensive, which is amazing, but people aren't really commenting on each other so much. It hasn't really evolved into a conversation <coughs> as much as we'd like, so that's something that we're working on. Oh, I'm going to dance back. <laughs> so one of the sort of research things we looked at, and I think Nancy Proctor um, brought this to our attention, um, was some Forrester research that showed, you know, how um, people participate in the social media world. And this is a chart we showed around a lot in July and August of 2010. And this was something we really wanted to keep in mind is that not everybody's a doer. There's a lot of watchers, right? There's lots of people who just read their Facebook page but never post. And we knew that would probably be the case. We've done some very preliminary testing, and I know we'll have a lot more results by the end of the exhibition. But you can see that ArtClicks shares that exact same profile. There are a lot of people reading comments, not as many people posting them. Um, and so so we were pleased to know that we've created something that is interesting to read and that it's working in the way that we thought the research indicated we should plan for. It's a little dance. Yes, it is. Um, so this is the last tab, um, the final about screen in the app, which includes um, information, general information about the museum and then a map specific to this exhibition. We'd also like to share our admin tool with you, which is how we were able to load and control all of the content in the app, which has been a really incredible thing to have. Um, all of this info, so as you can see, there's, um, you can load information about the artworks, the artists, uh, you can log comments, remove comments from the community screen from this board, um, and see all your users and user images. All this information is stored on a Rackspace cloud server. Our institution's IT department um, wanted it on a separate <coughs> server for security reasons. <coughs> this is um, just a detailed page of the artwork page um, showing how you can load the interpretive description, the medium, images, you can load audio content, all from your computer or your desk. Super easy. Thank you, Bruce. Really easy. And this is how uh, we could schedule comments. You may have noticed in the community stream some high educator comments. And we can actually do that immediately from our own devices. We could do that for um, the admin tool immediately, or we can schedule comments to happen throughout the week or month. You want to start with challenge, some sure. challenges? So we thought we'd just share a couple <coughs> challenges with you, and, and Bruce may talk a little bit more about this because it's maybe it's slightly over our heads, but the idea of the image recognition software was, for our side of it, was a very complicated thing in a sense because in order for the image recognition software to work, you have to make a video, as it turns out, of every single work of art in the show. And those of you who work in an art museum know there's not a lot of time during that installation period. And once all 116 objects were on view, we had to dash in and video every single one from every angle. Here's Nicole practicing because we wanted to be ready with someone from Second Story who was wheeling her around in the wheelchair so that she would be very steady and slow. In the end, she learned to walk because she's a ballet dancer so slowly that she could create this very... It was, but it was really an amazing thing to have to, to do. Let me, let me add one comment. It turns out image recognition is hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
That was it? Okay. We agree. <laughs> Turns out that it's hard. Um, uh, that was one of our greatest challenges, so there's more to say about that for those who want to talk about it. Um, we also really want, we spent a lot of time thinking about the character of the text that would be in the app, and Nicole and I took a couple days where all we did was talk about, like, what should that text be, and how should it be different than a label, and more engaging in a social media kind of world. Um, I'm going to let Bruce talk about the challenge of working in the Android world, but that was a challenge as well, so we just mentioned it. And image rights, as we said, is all also a challenge. Nicole spent a lot of time on the phone with people, and I know someone last night posted in the community, why isn't there an image of a Mondrian? Well, because they wouldn't give us permission. That's why there's not an image of a Mondrian. So these, these folks, and Allegra probably knows this better than we do, uh, all of these uh, organizations and foundations really care very much about how these images are used. This is another big challenge for us. The audio guide, all the different numbers on the wall, what am I supposed to do, how am I supposed to do it? I honestly can say we haven't conquered it yet, but we're getting closer. You know, as the head of interpretation, I really feel more tools is a good idea. There's a lot of different kind of people out there. They learn in different ways. I don't think the audio tour is bad. I love it. I think it's great. There's people who love it. I think this art clicks thing is great, and there are people who love that. But having them work together, I don't think we've found the perfect match yet. I know we have a lot of people who say, wait a minute, if I had that art clicks, I see there's one for every work of art. I would have audio for every work of art. No, there's still only those same 26 audio stops. That's all there is. But it's very hard to communicate that information. So it's a, a work in progress. There's a lot of training that we need to do with our security staff, our front of house staff, um, and that's an important element. So do you want to talk a little bit about uh, some of our testing, Nicole? Sure. Um, before we launched the app, we have a team team at the high, and we did some early testing with them, had some great ideas, great feedback, um, as well as with our college interns over the summer. Then once we launched the app, we actually brought in some graduate students in our history from the Savannah College of Art and Design and had them come in, use the app, also give feedback, but also help us populate the community and sort of start the conversation that we were hoping to see happening. Oh. <laughs> so I mentioned we've done some very early testing. This is very encouraging to me to see how happy people are with the usability and the way they get information in the app, the way they're able to download it. So as I said, these are super small sample sizes, but we're going to, by the end of the exhibition, really be able to say a lot, I think, about how people felt about the app and how easy or challenging it was to use. This is one of those slides I have trouble with because I'm still learning about Google Analytics, but I know lots of you understand. Um, this particular slide talks about the postcards that have been sent from the app, so those emails people are sending. Um, and you can see that um, people are sending emails. They're also getting this information. I'm going to mess it up, Nicole. You have to say. Well, I was just going to say, between, between the admin tool and the Google Analytics account that we have set up, we're able to look at a lot of information generated from the app usage, which is really nice. And that is you know, everything from how many times people are looking at postcards via uh, Facebook or other websites, who's blogging about us, to what are users taking images of, what are they commenting on, which is a really great thing to have. Okay, um, we are running out of time, but we wanted to point out that we've already had, after a month, we've been about a month um, since the launch, we've had some really great reviews, um, well, which are highlighted here, <laughs> onward. Um, and you can access more, download the app. We hope you already have. And there is a great uh, demo video on Second Story's website, which Bruce we hope you'll check it. out. Okay. Bruce might even show it. So soon we did it in time for questions, didn't we, Allegra? Yep. Yes. We practiced, and that's exactly how much time it took us when we practiced. <laughs> I just, we're pretty proud. <laughs> questions? <laughs> You were talking to them, do you want to say? Sort of yes. Um, with most of them, it was uh, more of just explaining a lot of it in detail. How is it going to work on social media? Will people be able to download the image, or is it a link? Um, and for most of them, after everything was fully explained and it was a lot of back and forth, it was fine and they were excited. There were two cases. Um, yeah, John's. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in, the, in the implementation, and this is in direct results of that potential concern, is that Whenever you share a postcard, you're only sharing a link to that postcard, and the postcard only ever lives on the high servers. And so it's actually part of their domain, as, and so it's clear that the, the ownership is, is, is authoritative and that it is there at the High Museum of Art, and that's the only place you can get that high-resolution image. 
we always kind of danced around that issue of like, could you technically download that image? Yeah, yeah you know, technically. But we, it, that's not the important part of the conversation. It was okay. that the image lives in the high, the only thing that's ever being shared is a link. The photo doesn't get posted to Facebook, I just thought. Mm -hmm. That's right. Although although Facebook API yeah, it takes a little snapshot of stuff, mm -hmm. right? But right. that's that's a bunch of my that's not. Yeah, the we didn't get into that detail with our folks. So I suppose one of them could figure out if they ever went to one of our Facebook pages that you could technically get that tiny little picture out of Facebook. And I guess if one of them calls us one day, I'll be like so so sorry. But mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm just curious. Um, this looks it looks really great, and um, it. These are for exhibitions, right? So what happens, like, so if there are links and we're sending them and we have this thing going on, what what is the plan post this? And if you do this for every exhibition, are you maintaining the old exhibitions? Or just are you just concerned about, like, the comments people have made? Because that's really the only... Um, the links to the images, that to the collection? No, the, 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 post, the postcards can stay as long as you want them to, right? They're, they're incrementally created over time, so if you do another 20 uh, exhibits, I would encourage you to do that, Pat. They're just accumulated. The server has tons of rooms. That's, that's, a, that's a minor issue. Um, in terms of the artwork assets that are being used, you know, they're, they're used for this particular exhibition. Those postcards typically will either use, you have an option of using the, the photograph you took or what we call the canonical image, which, which is actually mm -hmm. uh, stuff from, from MoMA. Um, and I don't know the, the full rights over that and what the long, long term of that. And yeah, obviously the postcards that have uh, user contributed images, they can move in perpetuity. All right, so we can take just one. leave them out there and they don't need care and feeding. And yeah. I think of it as sort of a transient thing, I have to say. You know, this is a conversation that's happening. I was hoping kind of in real time in the exhibition. It continues to go down and down and down. And, and I feel like when Picasso to Warhol, all that work goes back to MoMA and we do another show, a new conversation will start. I'm not as worried about that. I know some users may be, but I am not as worried about that. I can do one more. Okay. Is yes, the sir. assumption that any museum in the country could use the same ArtClix platform and then rebrand it, restyle it? Or, or is it, are we able to create our own artworks call something else. We, we're still talking about that. I know Pat had a nice chat so with our lawyers. It, you know, yeah. Basically. Yeah. And Bruce, and, Bruce and Pat and I were going to chat about that at lunch, but we just really don't know the answer to that right now. It's, it's, it's a non-trivial answer, not for any good reason other than, than there's, <coughs> there's a close level of cooperation between us and we're, we're colleagues. We, we have great ownership of the intellectual property. Right. Um, and then so the, the reality is, is why I pause and it's a long answer. In theory, there's nothing that prevents that. The practicalities of making that happen is not something we've explored or detailed. And so I don't know is the, is the real is yeah. the answer. But we want to talk about it some more. So okay. yeah. we will. And we'll, we'll get back to you. And my sense, I was yep. say, my sense from talking to the attorneys and from the conversations we've had is that, you know, because this technology is changing so quickly, you know, today's admin tool, fabulous as it is, Bruce, we love it, you know, What's the, we don't know what the shelf life of that is going to be. And as a museum, we're not in the licensing, creating, you know, business, this yeah. kind of product business. Yeah. So the expense that would be incurred by us, I just don't know what the ROI would be on that. Yeah, so the follow-up to that is Second Story typically doesn't create platforms and, and, uh, and license stuff. We typically, only, be, only because we treat, we treat every project as what well, you think you're, this is going to sound very arrogant. It's all said, Dr. Perfect. Um, <laughs> so, uh, that we, we, we believe that, that most people don't actually know what the, the crux of their experience ought to be. And so we'd actually rather work with you to figure out what's the, what's the proper solution for that. Yeah. For, the, for the high, they had some very unique circumstances that meant this was a good solution. Yeah. There may be elements of this that may be entirely appropriate for other places, but I can't say the exact same experience would work at another museum, I think. And I think, actually, I'd say that's the important takeaway in this is that every museum in here, whenever you see a project that's very interesting or sounds very compelling and exciting to you, just think about the parts of it that you actually like and what resonates with you. And, and, and recognize that all the rest is crap for you, and you don't care about that. So you want to you want to concentrate on the parts that are right for you. So yes, maybe elements could be licensed or an experience similar to it, or taking elements of it could be recreated. But don't just assume that taking this and putting your stuff into it is a good experience. We're switching with them. And on that note, we're going to switch to the first. There are a couple of seats scattered around here toward the front, if anybody wants to come and claim the space. <laughs> right, so I'm going to talk about a couple of different projects. Um, I'm from Second Story. Second Story Interactive Studios are located in Portland. Uh, because I know time is tight, I'm going to talk quickly, even though that's what I naturally do. So 
most of you won't tell any difference. Um, Second Story Interactive has been uh, making stuff for museums and kind of interactive experiences, websites, installations, uh, now mobile applications for the last 17 years or so. And we've worked with many of the finer institutions across the country. That's not to imply those of you we haven't worked with, they're not fine institutions, but nonetheless, we enjoy opportunities. Um, the High Museum art of Art was fantastic. And uh, the thing that's interesting in this is we, we had some, we looked at it very much from a user experience point of view. And the original premise is even though the High came to us with, these are the, the kind of the, the institutional needs that we have, we also began to look at the experience of what do people want to do in the art museum in the first place? And what are the, the actions that do people typically want to do? And if you come to any of these conferences, you hear all the time about the, the issues of people want to take photographs, but we have rights issues, and that prevents that from actually happening. That's a crappy experience. And so we decided to figure out how to capitalize on that experience and actually let people do what comes naturally. Take photographs of art, and then you share that sort of stuff, because that's the beauty of going to an art museum. That fundamentally is what's important. Some Along the way, there are some very difficult bits in, in what actually turned out to be a reasonably nice application. And uh, me being hypercritical, I'd be the first to say there are a number of small little things that I wish were different in the application and, uh, and some UI elements I wish worked a little bit differently. But nonetheless, I think the overall experience actually works pretty well as intended. And certainly the initial uh, visitor testing is, is bearing that out. Um, we talked about it, we touched on it earlier. Image recognition is hard. Um, that's such a non-trivial statement. Uh, the, we, we, went through, we went through actually a very fundamental metamorphosis of the project about halfway through it. The original company that we were going to work, uh, work with to do the image recognition was uh, were colleagues I had known from back in Boulder when I was in Denver um, that were doing that had done a startup that were doing image recognition and approached another of other companies, uh, MoMA in, part uh, in particular, Smithsonian had also I think had some initial discussions with uh, with the company and they decided that the business model wasn't working for them, and so they decided to cancel their service when we were about oh about two thirds of the way through the application, which um which sucked. Um, because that was, the, that was the critical bit, right? I mean, the whole experience is, is, is predicated on this premise of I'm going to take images and photographs and I'm going to do interesting stuff with it. And so suddenly we didn't have a mechanism for doing that. I guess the other thing I should add is, is the application tries to be smart and actually be aware of what you're doing. So if you have a, a, a phone that has a camera and you're at the high, it naturally starts in the camera mode. If you're not at the high, it actually starts you in a list mode so you can actually browse through images at home. And or if you don't have a camera but you're at the high, it gives you the pin thing as if you're doing a more of a traditional audio tour. So it tries to be smart. And we originally had this idea that as you would go through taking these photographs, you'd create your own small gallery of images and you'd be able to share that. And you'd actually have some, a personal element of collection. When, uh, when the image recognition decided to not be a feasible option anymore, <clears throat> we, we regrouped and actually re-explored the experience and, and eventually decided to protect ourselves and say that if we can't get it working, what should the experience be? And then recreate the recreate the whole thing in a way that if we could get image recognition to work, that it was a that it worked seamlessly but wasn't the fundamental barrier that it was going to be in the original instance. We had we had pinned our hopes a little too high on that being the pivotal way in and so we needed to make sure that if you went a different route that it didn't suck as a result. Um, we ended up talking to a number of different companies and ultimately we uh, through well actually harder than either of you know, a bunch of very difficult negotiation on the back end came up with reasonable licensing fees to actually make this work. Uh, the thing to know is that it is a software as a service that we're using. Uh, in this instance, we end up using a company out of Toronto called Idea, and I'm happy to talk about the API and how we incorporated that if anybody wants to know more detail about this offline. Um, there's a much more interesting discussion. I have uh, now talked to every company in the world that does image recognition, uh, including the product manager for Google Goggles, and uh, know what their plans are, and I'm happy to dish. <coughs> um, Idea is fantastic, by the way. And I think, and I think both, I think that I think the high team will attest that the technical team there worked extensively to make sure that as we were doing stuff, things worked well. It's it's interesting. One of the reasons that we we did end up going with them is because they had the video process. And in doing image recognition, there is a lot of capturing of images that needs to be done, so you get different permutations of a given object. Um, the reason that video came into play was actually because it's a very cheap way to get thousands of images of a particular object. So. When you're actually walking around, you know you're capturing at 60 frames a second or some other some other rate that you're you're collecting really just a whole lot of images that then are just easily fed into a database server and it processes those images. So the the video was actually this attempt at trying to deal with there was going to be very limited time to do the capturing and it felt like it could be reasonably efficient. Now the mechanics of making that work and how you actually do that ended up being a little bit tricky, but uh, Nicole through an intensive training program uh, I think succeeded in the, in the end result of that. The other thing to note is the application is. Uh, is primarily uh, HTML5 based. Uh, it's done through Sencha Touch. 
Um, Sense of Touch is a framework that I'll probably not suggest using again. Uh, Sense of Touch works incredibly well for what it's intended to do. When you start to go outside of the accepted norms on it, it becomes very, very hard to do. And there was a point probably about halfway through where I was looking at kind of the, the scope of errors that we had in the bug, the bug tracking that we were doing. And a number of the areas that we were running into were simply problems of Sense And I thought long and hard about actually just stopping development there and, and doing a native app instead. We didn't because we knew that we were also going to be developing for Android. And creating something that had a common shared code base was actually a pretty, way, a pretty good way to move forward with that. Um, and in theory, it was. Once we, once we conquered what those initial problems were and figured out how to, to uh, essentially make Sencha our bitch, it worked out reasonably well. <laughs> um, but Android ended up being its own particular set of problems. Um, in this case, it turns out that uh, the Android platform is incredibly fragmented, and anybody who's going to do development, I'll give you a heads up that you need more Q&A on that side than you think that you possibly do. Um, what we found was that every platform uh, or every, every vendor, any, every wireless carrier has a different implementation of Android. Not only that, but the individual makers of the Android phones also have different implementations of Android. And so what we did is we're using the, the system camera as the way to capture images. On every Android device, it's different and incredibly buggy, it turns out. And so what, what we ultimately discovered is that we've been using kind of some standard versions for testing. Those worked out pretty well. I've already used up like half my time, haven't I? You have six minutes. Okay, good. I'm perfect. Uh, on the time. Um, <laughs> and so, so with Android, it ended up being a case of that we had this horrible set of bug issues. We'd, we'd, we'd resolve it on a couple of phones, and then we'd give it a, send it to our friends at the high, and, be, and Nicole has a phone that we don't have, and she'd be like, well, this doesn't work at all for me. And uh, bless their hearts, they're not technical people. And so we ended up going through this horrible cycle of trying to figure out what was actually wrong without actually seeing what was actually wrong, and no good way to really debug those particular devices. Android development is very, very hard. Um, and... I wish it were better, and part of it's because we did go for this HTML5 approach, this hybrid approach that you know we ended up creating a set of scenarios that made it harder for ourselves, but ultimately we ended up writing our own camera plug-in, um, superseding whatever system elements were there. And as long as you approach with the idea that you're going to create the tools that exist on Android to work with all of your app, and you're not actually counting on things in the system, you're probably in a pretty good starting point. And that would be the takeaway lesson I have for that. That's our clicks. Moving on. We, uh, we've been experimenting a lot with HTML5 and ways to incorporate that into exhibits and other experiences over the last year. I think there's kind of this blend of, of the modern day transition of what different devices are and how you engage with them. And where we typically think of, hey, there's mobile stuff, there's web stuff, there's stuff in an exhibit. I think that we're at the point where we're going to say that's not really the case anymore. You're looking at the digital presence of an organization. And all these things are just different lenses into that. And those of us who like to pretend that we're smart will say, hey, there's got to be a way for us to either repurpose that content, which I think a lot of people have had that conversation. You know, what we use on the website, we want to make sure that we use again in an app. But then also at the same time, you want to say, the development effort that I'm putting in, how you engage with this particular stuff, it would be nice if I could leverage that again in other formats. Uh, we did a project for LA Plaza um, down in Los Angeles. Um, and it's a, it's a cultural center, and we, we wanted to create this experience where we have an exhibit where people engage on a regular basis, contributing material online. The, the museum is actually pretty vocal on Twitter and encourages a lot of community engagement. But then also there's a story capturing kiosk as part of this exhibit, and we wanted to make, make an experience that, that accumulated these voices into an experience. We end up creating these cultural mosaics, and I don't have a video of it, unfortunately, but what you end up having is the, are these large screens, which are all HTML5 based. You can actually load this up in a web browser as opposed to the final format that is presented here. And it incorporates all of these elements in a very dynamic way. And so we're pulling in live Twitter streams. We're pulling in videos from the, the kiosks that are actually in the, uh, in the gallery. Those, those videos actually then also go out onto YouTube. And there's kind of this, this great permeability of the different experiences. And this ends up being the initial focus. But in this case, this was another one where we'd end up using Sencha as a framework. And it was very, very hard. Um, uh, Sencha is not, not designed to run as a kiosk 14 hours a day. And, and the, the issues that we had with browsers and kind of dealing with the plug-in, the plug-in infrastructure there is difficult. Um, we had to do a lot of troubleshooting. And ultimately, we ended up developing our own custom JavaScript applications to work with kind of the rudimentary elements of Sencha and some other frameworks, um, one other that doesn't come to mind, uh, to ultimately build the experience. And so again, Q&A on this ended up being a lot harder than we thought it would be. The end experience actually is, feels no different from Flash. You bring it up in a browser, it feels exactly like the sort of stuff you do. And in fact, in hindsight, there are some things I wish we hadn't done, like um, if you look at these little boxes, you can, you can tap on any one of them, they, they pull up a little bit of content. And true to as if we'd done with Flash, it still stays, stays, stays in a small little window They have to scroll through, which I think is actually a pretty crappy experience. We didn't actually take, do uh, take full, full advantage of the entire screen, which, which I wish we had in retrospect. But in terms of the, the user experience, it actually stays pretty consistent to itself, 
and it works pretty well overall. It certainly has been interesting to begin to explore how to use HTML5 as kind of the fundamental way of how to do exhibit technologies and leveraging that experience. We, at, at some base level, we, uh, we accept that Flash is in its waning days, and we're moving away from that. So we've also done a couple of projects at the University of Oregon, the Ford Alumni Center. There are two pieces in particular. Uh, the, I'll go into the alumni table first. Uh, what it is is, is that the Ford Alumni Center is really the gateway to the university. And the, the university at some point begins to recognize that early on there was this idea that in the same way that, that water running over the landscape changes the bedrock and the bedrock informs the water, that there are elements of that experience that the university is the bedrock, but the students and the alumni that go through ultimately shape the university into a two-way street. And so we ended up creating two different elements that reflected that. There are these alumni tables, which are essentially the river in the space, and then there are the Oregon Cascades, which I'll look at in a moment, which end up being essentially a waterfall through the space of content. The alumni table is kind of a quick forward, straightforward way to have every alumni over the past of the entire history of the college or the university be able to find themselves, find a little bit of history about themselves. The initial interface is, uh, this is in, this is a, oh crap, that's a framework. Uh, I'll look it up in a moment when I'm done, when we're answering questions. Um, there's an OpenGL layer that runs on here that does all the flowing particle systems. And then as you begin to engage with those, they form little O's, which are the university symbol that flow around it. And every time you touch that, it then expands into an interface that allows you to, to look for that. The thing that's interesting is, so this is a, a multi-touch table, multi-touch uh, cell from, um, or uh, made by multi-touch, it's a multi-touching cell, is that uh, one of the things we, we fail to consider early in the process is, oh, good, perfect is there's a lot of direct sunlight, and anybody who's done multi-touch, I'm sure all of you have, um, recognize that sunlight interferes with that horribly. And so what we end up doing is actually developing this HTML5 interface and going through a couple different iterations of it in order to get it to work in direct sunlight and actually making it work. So I'd actually say the hardware for the table is incredibly good. It's flexible, but it also took a lot of work. But this is all HTML5 based. It's, these are essentially transparent web pages that are sitting on top of an open GL layer and contents flowing through that. So it's a tied to a back-end database with uh, a couple hundred thousand students and information about each of them. In a different part of the space are the Oregon Cascades. <coughs> Again, HTML5 based experience. In this case, looking at content of the entire university and what it's done over the different departments over the last uh, 60, 70, 80 years. And there are these floor to ceiling columns of, of screens that are giant multi-touch surfaces. So you can go up and touch any element that's flowing on the screen, move it around, uh, dive in deeper with individual bits of information. Again, all HTML5 based, a little bit of OpenGL in the background, and then tied to an incredibly robust uh, content management system on the back end that we custom built for them to handle all the content. There's something around uh, 400,000 individual stories in this, another, or I'm sorry, about 400,000 individual images, about 80,000 pieces of content, and then I want to say another 5,000 movies along with that. But overall, that's worked out pretty well. The thing that's been interesting is also that uh, the whole, the whole columns are configurable in the space. They're actually on individual tracks. So as they change uh, the venue for particular events, they, uh, they can change the configuration. There's also a nice mode, um, which we'll come back to in a moment, that if you push a couple of them together, my timing is bad. If you push a couple, let's try it again. When you push a couple of them together, they merge into a single large contiguous surface. They are aware of that, and they adapt to begin to interface with that way. in the other direction, looking at mobile devices and different ways to use them. Um, I am a firm believer now that the iPad is the best kiosk in existence. Um, it is self-contained uh, at, at the price point that it is. It's a screen, it's a computer, it has wireless access, um, and it's a far more cost-efficient solution than any other kiosk that we've ever built in the past. So for the cost of about $400 per, uh, per iPad, <clears throat> we ended up creating a set of experiences for National Geographic for their Anglo-Saxon Horde exhibit that opened in D.C. two, three weeks ago. And what you end up having is a series of four different iPads <clears throat> that run a custom native application. In this instance, we have not perverted HTML5. In this, in this case, we actually did a native application. Because HTML5 can't deal with some of the assets that are here. In this case, like you'll see that when you tap on an individual object in the collection, it expands to a very high-resolution version. Um, for the number of images and the data that's involved in that, HTML5 begins to bog down, and we start to have memory issues with that. And so it really did become easier to to build it as a native application. The other thing too is that um, iOS in particular and the development tools for that have a lot of custom or have a lot of basic features built into them that make development very, very good. And so a lot of the things that you see on here we actually get for free, like this scan this uh, expanding the double tap to zoom, being able to pan around and having things be very quick and responsive, having video controls are all things that normally we would have had to write in HTML5 and simply are a part of iOS. And so 
in this case, doing uh, native applications worked really, really well. The thing that was tricky, and we had this a frank discussion with National Geographic early on, is in order to make them run as kiosks, you want to protect the 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 all the settings in the environment and not let the user actually do anything. And you also need to be able to disable the hardware buttons. That's not possible with the stock iPad. And so with a jailbroken iPad, it's actually relatively easy to do this, and a little bit of uh, Unix know-how. So you know, it's something that everybody can do at home. Um, <laughs> The thing that's actually very nice is that uh, the applications are aware of themselves. The iPad, we've, we've done some custom scripting, in the back, custom scripting in the background that they're aware of the applications running. If somebody tries to quit out of it, if for some reason the hardware buttons have not been covered up, if you quit out of it, it will immediately relaunch within a second or two. If for some reason it crashes, it will immediately relaunch in a second or two. It's very aggressive about it. Uh, it also goes into a sleep mode at the end of the day where the screen dims because uh, well, I've not seen any good stats about screen burning. It's always one of those things, but we didn't necessarily want to have a screen saver mode per se, and uh, I'm happy to share how to do that, the custom hackery. I think I've actually forwarded to a couple people, Coven, maybe you, Nancy, I think I've forwarded to you at some point, about what to do to make an iPad into a kiosk that will run um, hours a day, and uh, and then also how to disable the hardware buttons. It takes, uh, you need to know a little bit what, what you're doing, but it's not incredibly hard, and I would encourage a lot of people to begin to look at this as a reasonable alternative. The only downside, of course, is that it's a smaller screen, but also that form factor, when people see it, they actually know how to do it. So all of these multi-touch experiences and, and gest gestures that people are using, they already know how to do that when they realize it's an iPad and from the experience of iOS in general. So we've turned that to our in our in our advantage. One last thing, I think. <clears throat> we've also there's a little bit of technical information in the back of this. We've uh, recently launched a project here at World of Coke that looks at uh, that looks at creating stories about what a uh, this is going to look. Yeah, so this is in prison. Um, no, what it is is there's a large there's a large wall that ends up being a portrait experience, and what we do is we use Kinect cameras to do depth sensing in front of that. And the thing that's, that's particularly unique is that we've figured out a way to network multiple Kinect cameras and then use those to create a, a point cloud of data, which um, nobody else in the country is doing. Even my, we're friends with Microsoft Research now, as a result of it, and clearly it's an experience that uh, that nobody else is doing. The thing that we try and do is actually cause this entire surface to be reactive to the presence of visitors. So when you casually walk by it, and then we walk in front of the image. Um, that begins to react to you. And it's the presence of you that actually is a critical part of that experience. So here you can begin to see each different color is one of the different Kinect cameras, and we're stitching them together to create the sense of people where people are in space. And then these are the different interactive zones. And as you stand in front of those different zones, things begin to appear in the wall. The portrait wall is essentially about corp the corporate work that Coke has done beyond just selling fizzy water every day. But instead, they actually have a number of initiatives around the world. Whether they are sincere and good is a different issue, but let's pretend that they are. Um, they are good projects that, that they highlight those things with individual stories of people from around the world. And so as you approach, the wall begins to effervesce in front of you, and as you get closer, the story begins to appear, and the video that goes along with it will play in a moment, any moment. There you go. And it ends up being a very simple reactive experience. And so, you know, in this case, we begin to look at kind of entire environments, and, and this would be back on kind of that bailiwick of, of think about interactive surfaces not just as kind of kiosks or touch screens, but rather that the entire place around you can be interactive. There's no reason that these entire walls, that these surfaces, that anything that you see in front of you isn't a way for visitors to begin to interact with content. And there are always different ways to do that, and some of them actually end up being very, very cheap. Those Kinect cameras are, you know, $1,500 for that entire installation, never mind that the... Uh, that the screens that you see behind it are then also a million dollars at a different point. <laughs> <laughs> and that's only because we use Christie micro tiles. We could have done the same thing with a bunch of flat panel displays. But just in this case, most it turns out that uh, very few monitors actually recreate Coke Red in the proper way. This is one of the few few services that do. And so I, I, you know, I'd love to say that we went, we went needlessly expensive. They went needlessly expensive. Well, no, they went deliberately expensive because it actually meets their corporate brand and image. So that's it. A bunch of projects. Stuff that we do. One minute. Somebody ask, talks quickly. Yes. Uh, I have a question about the conversation you guys had uh, regarding maintenance and updates of these uh, applications. Yes. So the, the question regard is how did you negotiate that because of the, the problems with changing iOS 5, iOS 6, and like gingerbread and, you know. Well, the exhibit is a short-term loan. Is one of the benefits of that it's not necessarily there for a thousand years. So we know there's a finite time and window. When we initially figured out, um, the thing that's generally good about most of the upgrades is they don't, they're they're pretty good at dealing with legacy stuff. I've yet to see anything significantly break going uh, backwards. It's it's that you know if you try and and, and develop, develop something now, will it exist on earlier devices? Mm -hmm. Early on, we decided there's a baseline that we're going to support. Uh, I can tell you this on 
Well, I don't know if I already tried it on an original iPhone. I'm not sure if it runs on the original iPhone. No, remember that one guy with the comment who it won't run on his original iPhone? Yes, that's reading? right. He gave us a one rating because... It that's right, and we all agreed that, yeah. yeah. Never mind what we agreed. He needs to upgrade software. <coughs> yeah, uh, so there are, there are legacy devices, but I think we said in practice that it was iPhone 3 and up, so we covered essentially the last two and a half, three years. Uh, Android, we set up baseline... Um, of what was relevant about a year ago. I'm not seeing any new things break it, um, but the, the reality is, is while we don't have a formal support arrangement, Second Story has never abandoned any of our clients over time, and if problems arise, we'll always work with them. And I'm not just giving a corporate spiel. I mean, that, that's sincere. I mean, the reality is, at the end of the day, if your stuff doesn't work, it sucks for everybody, and we don't want to be a part of that. And so yeah. we'd rather figure out how to make it right and make it work, and we've always done that on this and other projects. And on that note, I think we'll move on and we come back to more questions. Okay, well, I'll try to speak. I, I wish I could show cascading walls and, like, all that cool stuff. I mean, that, now I'm following up with this. But um, just to also let you know, Ted Forbes, my colleague from the Dallas Museum of Art, is going to present with me today. He unfortunately could not be here, but he's there here in spirit. Um, I just wanted to give you guys um, a chance. I mean, there's a lot of people in this room, but how many of you in your institution have a mobile tour or a current mobile program at all? Okay. So it's a good, it's a good percentage. Um, about a year ago, we, I was very much in the minority of we had our kind of our standard audio tour, and we were really at the position of, you know, do we move forward with a mobile tour? What are the advantages and disadvantages, or do we um, do we stick kind of with our current contract? And so it was this very much of a, a dilemma for us, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about of our in-house process and development of creating a, a mobile tour um, using um, a web based mobile tour, and then I'll also walk you through a bit about kind of Ted's process too. Um, so I just wanted to quote Ted that even though a lot of a lot of that I'm going to talk about is um, based in technology, that you know pri our priority is delivering a really great user experience and quality of content. Visitors want to come to the museum to have a deep experience. They're not here to use an iPod. So, but we really want to de deliver a really great experience for them. So, um, so I was at the point, and I know that maybe some of this is a little bit, um, you know, kind of old um, information for you, but, you know, coming um, from a small institution where we didn't really know what to do with our current audio content, we were faced with, you know, there are two different kind of animals of delivering our current content. We didn't know if um, creating a web-based tour was the right way to go, or should we do something that's device native? So if you can think about having something on your device that's installed directly. It's something that you search on your app store. You can type in museum. You'll get an array of a variety of applications. Um, or if you do something that's web-based, it was a little bit more, we thought, accessible, where you can, where it works with inside the web browser. There was no need to download anything. Um, it was optimized for a mobile screen and offers a variety of functionality. But they often look the same. Sometimes, And often, in our current app at the Nelson Atkins, looks very much like something that you would download. So there are some, there's similar things, but ours is kind of delivered in a different way. Um, so this is just some screenshots. If you go to naguide.org, that is um, the mobile guide. Um, you'll notice that it's, it's a simple keypad where a lot of our works of art, they're, um, they're, there's a three-digit um, number where you can simply enter in content or you can either browse by collection. And then Ted as well, he develops mobile tours in a different way where he does things a little bit more thematically. And you can see here that um, um, he actually uses um, HTML5 to, um, to ha have his tours delivered in a more kind of image-based way. Um, our mobile tour offers text space, so there's, um, there's labels, there's audio content. Um, at the Dallas Museum of Art, there's also video as well. There's a little bit more of our screenshots. Um, so something that was a major, uh, once we decided to do a web-based mobile tour, we needed to have Wi-Fi, which is a huge challenge. The Nelson Atkins, it's a 1933 building. It was really hard to place access points. And actually, this bottom area is the ceiling of our galleries. And so we had to do a lot of in our beta testing, figuring out the right places to do our access points 
And it's still a challenge. We also have the sculpture park as well, but Ted noted that that was a major um, a development infrastructure. Okay, so which, uh, which animal wins? When we're thinking about doing um, a device native in house, it was very much a, we thought it would include more development, and if we wanted to ever um, if we ever wanted to include more data or updates, we would, you would have to re-download it in the App Store. And our web-based application links to our TMS, so um, if there are any changes made, it could happen in real time. And then also with the web-based, we thought that it could reach a broader audience. Um, it would also have a broader reach with, um, with more devices. Um, but both ways um, require more staff resources and maintenance as well. So there are endless possibilities when considering the mobile web. Um, the design is fairly simple for if you're just essentially just creating a really small mobile web browser. And with HTML5, there's always a backup so that when using HTML5, you can consider um, it can it can understand what. Um, what device is calling the website so that it can, if it's an Android or if it's an iPhone or it's any or it's an iPad, it can um, it can it can frame the website accordingly. And then also with the content, you can always change the content. And then our um, and then our current content management systems are open source, and but there's also <coughs> options for commercial. So um, part of understanding if we wanted to do something that was web-based, we first wanted to ask the experts with our visitors. We wanted to see what their take was, what devices they were bringing, and if they were comfortable using their own devices. Um, we did a study with a variety of our visitors, and we actually found that they were more comfortable using kind of our older devices that we had available. So we really were conscious about um, creating an interface that mimicked our old devices by retaining the keypad. Um, but then we also noticed that our, our, our majority of our visitors were um, of, of the older set, so between 55 and 64. And then, um, so, but it's interesting that more and more of them said that they were given um, iPods or, um, or even iPads, and so, um, so that their kids were really wanting them to use it. So we're, so we're slowly seeing a, a larger population bringing in their own phones. And this also, this um, diagram also shows kind of the split up of um, the majority of people using an Apple app, iPhone, um, how many, uh, and Android as well. We also found in our, um, in our evaluation that majority of people were using Blackberry, so we wanted to make sure that we had a mobile website that was optimized for Blackberries. Um, so, so we just wanted to. So I just wanted to show you a little bit about um, kind of the differences of right now with our web-based creating an application in-house that we're doing. Um, we're working with jQuery Mobile, which has helped us to um, have less production time. It's easy to update. Um, there is more cross-platform and in for integration, um, but it does require Wi-Fi, obviously. Um, and then something like a more of a question that we had is do we go with a mobile web vendor or do we do it in-house? And then there is something that we were, we were really curious about kind of having a third-party relationship um, even though they could offer a lot um, because they, their tools are already developed. But, um, but something that vendors do offer is kind of revenue sharing mo model which is something to consider um, if you do want to do something that's more um, available in the App Store. So this shows you a little bit about um, when we took on when we took on the web-based uh, process that um, that we had to do a lot of it in-house. So all of our script development, our media production, publishing to devices, hardware provisioning, and um, marketing and sales, we, we entirely do in-house. Um, but this could not have been done without entire team effort. So really consider if you're thinking about doing a web-based application, um, that education, curatorial design, and IT, and visitor services continuously need to be involved. Um, part of our training that was really um, 
uh, something important to consider is the amount of training that needs to happen on our front end staff. We have a fleet of 50 iPods that we give out to our visitors, and so it was very important that we keep training with our visitor staff, that they're able to do some troubleshooting, that, they're, that even our security guards are able to, to understand how to use it. Um, and then, so now that we are adopting this web-based model, we can certainly change it up. So we've taken our older, older look and we're now adopting it for some of our featured exhibitions. And we're doing, um, with the Road Dan, we created an interactive map of the Gates of Hell, and this was done with jQuery Mobile. Um, and so you can select, um, you can select a, a, one of the map cats within the exhibition. You can see where it lies within the map of the Gates of Hell, and it provides a little bit of information. So that's been um, quite successful, and we're also using um, QR codes. So the five things that we wish we should have known when adopting a web-based app was that to limit hardware, we even though we purchased um, a fleet of 50 iPods, that it was actually more than we actually needed. More people are bringing their own devices, and so we actually have 25 out, so it's something to consider. And then also inherently understand their cross-platform needs that more people are, especially within the Kansas City area, are bringing not only in um, iPhones, but also Blackberries and iPads, and so making sure that you have something that's accessible and you can deliver a good experience. Um, we also underestimate the um, need for staff and visitor training. Um, I think it's, you want the people to feel comfortable with delivering the advice to visitors. Um, we also found that um, some of our iPods that we had kept on timing out, so we had to put extra code in, we had to, insert code in to ensure that that did not happen with our devices. And again, retrofitting our building was particularly challenging. But some of the best decisions we made was working across and doing a pan-institutional approach and working across um, to all staff. Um, obviously, choosing a web-based app was provided a variety of flexibility for us. Um, it's multi-platform, so we're able to actually, because it's a web-based, you can actually play with it on your desktop. Um, and then maintaining a similar interface as our older units made people feel extremely comfortable with the device. Um, and then mostly, by far, asking our visitors to inform the design and help choose was one of the best decisions. So in summary, consider your options that you, know, you don't necessarily have to do a contained, really uh, a native application, but you can. There's web apps offer a variety of flexibility. Um, you can look at costs. Um, in terms of developing our web app was something very simple that we could do and we could try out and we, it wasn't a big commitment to us. It was more of just an experiment. And then look at HTML5 because that ended up being a great uh, service for providing um, if someone's bringing a device that they can um, have the content regardless. And then obviously putting the priority of the user experience and quality of content first, and that knowing that although the iPad was particularly flashy, that, um, that it really isn't about that, and that the reason why it is popular at our museums is that, um, is that the content is, is very good for, for our visitors. So that's about it. Tag is there, but it's only in some of the early betas in the browser. I think the WebKit nightly will actually support 
the camera tag, but it's it's very sketchy at the moment. In every instance, what you need to do then is actually put in one of the, the existing wrappers that allow you access to the hardware, which is why we found Essentia for some of the original stuff, is it gave us access to the camera while still doing almost all the work that we did in HTML5. And so when you use that wrapper, that'll give you the access to the hardware, to the hardware elements that HTML5 can't access. Does that mean you have to put it through the Apple Store then? Uh, you can you can you can do anything through the app, uh, Apple's App Store. They have no problem with things that are done that way. Um, obviously, the High Museum of Art is actually pretty close to that, and it's available through the App Store and the Android Marketplace. Well, thank you very much. I think we'll hold any more questions, and we'll continue with our last uh, of the four presentations, and hopefully, we'll have some time for general questions at the end. So. And you're going to stop I'm me if I am out of control. <laughs> okay. <Take it> away, <laughs> Hi. Sorry I wasn't here earlier. Um, but this is the thing that I came to the conference that I really wanted to talk about. I was I, This is a follow-up to a session I did last year. Uh, and I was really excited about it last year, and it was just starting, but I didn't really have any findings. And so uh, I came back this year to talk about some of the things that we've discovered. So you know, I'm really excited about the possibilities of the ultimate interactive device, as, as Peter Samus describes in uh, 2007. And this is a picture of the ultimate interactive device. And the ultimate interactive device is the, uh, the person on the left. I, uh, it's so interesting doing this work and being in all these sessions where there's so much being talked about uh, having to do with kind of the interface with the, with the with the technology and so much about you know this, this mobile movement and the interface you know what how do you make that connection with the media and how do you keep people engaged and you know we know from the research that most people come to the museums in groups most people come to the museums for social experiences a lot of people take tours uh, even though there might be a mobile tour, there's still a lot of people that line up at 2 o'clock for that, that museum tour. And at the same time, we know that those tours haven't changed since the beginning of time. And, um, I mean, and not in any real big ways. There's been lots of different things like VTS and other ways in, but there's all sorts of really interesting things we can do. And so uh, we were really excited to, to explore what it meant to actually introduce media social media, uh, media into a social space uh, in a facilitated way. Uh, so that's what this project is about. Uh, this this uh, picture here is, is how docents were doing this before, where they would often carry a book, they would carry some you know, a folder of photographs, sometimes they'd carry a, a beaver pelt so that you could, you know, the kids could touch the beaver pelt. Um, but that, so we're looking to move beyond that. No, not that we can do virtual beaver pelts yet, <laughs> but there'll be a way. No. So the things that here's the things that we were interested in, and some of this, if you were there last year, it will be this, you'll have, be familiar with it. But I wanted to start here so you knew where we where we were starting. So we're really interested in how the visitors responded, of course, since that's what this is ultimately about. How the docents or tour guides uh, would respond to you integrating uh, tablets into their uh, tours. The general museum educators in the education department, and kind of the, the, the and the museum wide and the community, meaning you guys, response to this. We were really interested in kind of politically how it how it would work out. We were also interested in what kind of obstacles there were, uh, you know, everything from political and psychological obstacles about you know docents carrying technology around, and what kind of physical things as well as technical obstacles, and then really looking at what kind of logistics are needed to make this a actually work. And I can tell you right now, as a preview, this is the most important part of the whole thing. So I'm just going to throw some slides in here. Here is a, uh, a panel from a roundhouse. And the, the docent in this particular case is showing a video of the, a, a real roundhouse and uh, some historical footage. So this is a little bit about how the project came to be. Uh, my partner and I first wrote an article at, for the Visual Art Research Journal talking about how do we bring technology into these group tours. But it was before the iPad had actually even been, uh, you know, not even uh, announced at that point. We started to do the, the, our initial testing with the HP Touch Smart 
uh, laptop, which was a dismal failure for uh, everything from battery life to uh, screen brightness. And then, you know, luckily we got uh, funding to do some research, and the iPad was released right about the same time. This is a, a tour guide showing bronze casting uh, in the Chinese gallery, uh, just to, to provide some context out as to how these objects uh, came into being. So these are the phases to the projects. First, we looked at hardware, media, and app selection. Uh, we figured out, we did some trial tours and tried to figure out ahead of time before involving docents at all. We work with the seasoned museum educators who actually trained the docents and managed that. Uh, we defined some best practices and then we went into doing the tour guide training and did some assessment. So uh, we looked at a lot of apps and now remember this is a year ago when we started doing this and, we, and really what we fell back on was working with the Apple apps themselves, working with uh, photos, working with Google Maps, working with the iPod for managing music and video, uh, and, and Safari. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. But this is one of the, actually one of the most challenging things is to try to figure out an easy way to m manage multiple types of media uh, in a very fluid, uh, fluid way. So, and, and so this is how the, the docents you know, ended up doing it, was basically developing stacks. As you might know if you work with many photographs, this is a really inefficient, hard to manage way, but it was really what we were limited to when we started. Um, and so, you know, we had great details. What we thought originally, I'm going to just kind of preview the, video, the findings along the way. What we thought originally was that people, the things that were going to be the most interesting were the dynamic pieces of media, the audio, the video. And those are, those are interesting, but the, things that are, the thing that's the most interesting is the ability just to go and pinch and zoom and show really close details for things that are stuck in vitrines that you can't really see, uh, show just really different views. And that's the thing that the docents find the most interesting, and that's the thing that you actually hear the oohs and ahs from the uh, visitors when you're watching them in the, in the tour group, observing them taking the tour. Because you can really pull out things that you can't see that are very, very small, or open, open things that are closed and so on. We do a lot with you know, contextualizing things with video. Um, so this is a... Uh, transformation mask again northwest coast and if I can and so we have videos like this that actually you know that mask is very dead in the in the case but here you show uh, it in a traditional dance I mean you're all familiar with this but it's yeah. always been in a kiosk in the corner or, or in a video room but to actually have the docent be able to pull this out and show this very short segment in the tour really can can bring it to life Well, I'm going to move on, but in the end, the mask opens, or maybe, yeah, there you go. All right. So again, we use, for managing the videos, we were, we were using basically playlists uh, and putting, video, putting the videos and the audio files into playlists. Uh, maps are really great to be able to, for a docent to take uh, and bring a, and integrate a map into uh, say a, uh, a map of Venice that's in the MIA's collection, and for the docent to be able to actually go to Google Maps and you know and reveal different ways of looking at that same landscape today, and really show people you know connect it to the world that we live in today, uh, can be really fascinating. And then for the docents who have become very skilled. They actually can dynamically use it, and um, one of the one of the pieces at the MIA is a ve very large Chihuly uh, chandelier in the front lobby that's actually lit by neon. And so, one of somebody asked what neon was, and uh, one of the docents uh, 
went and she didn't herself know right off the top of her head, but she went and looked it up really quickly, and then they all discussed uh, what she had found on, about NEON. So there's that ability basically to just use it as a kind of serendipitous resource uh, for what you need. So um, just a little bit about what we need in apps and what we don't have in apps. This still, as far as every, I look at apps all the time and it's really hard to actually uh, assess if there is one that does this. Um, we've looked at file app and there's a million other things that are like this. The problem is, is there's nothing that lets you integrate URLs, video, audio, photographs, uh, all together uh, uh, in one place in a way that you can organize them into folders that would be attributed to an individual user. You want your docent to be able to say, I'm going to go do the Asian tour and to be able to have all their resources in one place rather than having to jump between all these different applications. Uh, you know, if you think doing a PowerPoint presentation in front of a group like this is hard. It's a lot harder to be managing apps on, the, on, the, on there. So, uh, just in, in the ability to do things like aliasing. I mean, we're all used to doing shortcuts and aliases. There is no such thing right now on the iPad. So you can't, you know, if you're going to use an asset in multiple places, again, we need some way of, of being able to do that. So we did a lot of different trials. We did this in pairs. We would have one docent uh, observe and one docent uh, present and watch body language. There would be uh, interviews with both the docent uh, afterwards as well as with members of the, the public to get a sense of, of what they liked and didn't like. You can tell most of what works purely by observation, I believe. There's so much body language involved, so much of just watching people's interest, hearing uh, how they're responding, and, um, and, and you can just tell if the docent's you know, handling the iPad very well. Um, and these are kind of the things we've looked at. So just strategies, how they navigate the content, how they integrate it into the tour, and, uh, and kind of visitor engagement. So some of the things we found initially was that the, that the portability was not an issue. There was, some, there was a lot of concerns about how's the docent going to be dragging it around. Well, that wasn't, that wasn't too big of an issue. Um, the tour guides that were trained well, and we'll get to that in a minute, navigated pretty well without uh, difficulty. And the brightness of the screen is, is tremendous. I mean, it, it, most museum galleries are pretty dim, and it's one of the things that's really beautiful about it is to be able to pull that iPad screen out, and it just really, uh, it's easy to see, even in a, a fairly good-sized group, if it's, if it's held up high. So some of the best practices we arrived at after doing a lot of testing is first, you know, pretty judicious use. Uh, that, that, you know, we tried to make it so that the docents weren't doing iPad tours. They were thinking about doing a tour and using the iPad in ways that were, where it would actually enhance the tour and it was appropriate to where they felt the audience was at the moment. In other words, if they felt like the audience was completely engaged with the object and the iPad, integrating the iPad in would in interrupt that experience, they wouldn't do it. But if they felt that, uh, you know, that, that there was an opportunity to explain something that people, they would ask a question, how many of you are familiar with the casting project, a, a casting process, and people would say, you know, a lot of people would not, uh, or that they didn't know, that's an opportunity to bring it in. So it, and that's one of the tougher things to train people to do is to really, it's like being an expert teacher, is looking at your audience, assessing what they need, and being really able to respond in that way. Again, these are all things you learn as a, as a, as a teacher. Uh, you know, how to develop a good transition in and out of media. This is what we try to teach people when using museum content in the classroom. You we're basically teaching the tour guides the exact same principles as how to work into it, how to work out of it, so you just it's just not something in the back of your mind you're going to throw out because you know it fits in right here. Um, another thing is really to hold the iPad away when locating content so that uh, the, dos the, the master docents at this have, dis deliv have discovered ways to get people, the audience, to really be looking closely while they're actually setting, the, setting up for showing something. So that they're not sitting there watching the docent. What's the docent doing with the iPad? Um, which is what they will do if you don't actually, you know, give them some direction. Show, show the screen at chest high or higher. Um, 
it's natural for people to want to hold it like this, but it doesn't work very well. Um, oh, and, the, and one of the tricks that we learned, can I use this? One of the tricks we learned, we learned, learned this actually from Apple was, is it going to work now? I've got to unlock it. Well, it's not. It, I'm just going to demonstrate, but it's not going to work because it's not, it's not mine. But if you, if you have this, you can be looking at it like this, changing it, and then just flip it over um, because it will write itself. Rather than a lot of your natural instinct is to not think that it's automatically going to flip itself over. <laughs> right. So it's right for me right now, and then I turn it over, and you know it's right for you. So it, it, it's this kind of just. There's so much about just training people how to be fluid in integrating it, uh, integrating it. In. <laughs> so just some more short video pieces. Narrate. Most of the docents have chosen to narrate the video and actually talk about what's going on rather than try to use uh, the audio in the video. Um, this is also really important. Darken the screen and kind of close the cover and the, the, uh, the iPad experience is over when it's over. It's not like you're carrying around the glowing iPad and waiting, because everybody's anticipating what's going to happen next. So you really got to turn that show off and move on and practice, practice, practice. So we partnered with our local Apple store who has a training lab and had all the docents, to, and none of these people owned iPads, have the docents all come in and go through uh, training on just the iPad itself. How does it work? What are apps? How do they work? And so they became very familiar with just the hardware, the software, uh, not anything about thinking about using it in a tour. Just here's an iPad, here's how it works. And the Apple people did, did a great job. They're very, very excited about, uh, about this. And then from that and from the best practices, then we had two uh, large workshops that we held. And this was, this was completely voluntary. The, the MIA has a docent pool of over 300 uh, docents. And for the first session, we had 75 people sign up. And for the second session, we had 75 people show, sign up, which blew our minds because many of these folks are older. They're technology phobic, and we were very nervous about interest. But there was, uh, there was amazing interest. So we then modeled behavior, and then, you know, then sat down and with the with the individual tour guides and worked with material that the the museum had already identified would be assets that would be particularly useful that they could they knew that the docents were already either using in some other form or the docents had expressed interest in it. Uh, the implementation is really simple. I mean, this is the beauty of this, honestly, is that when compared to all the stuff we're talking about with all the programming and development and everything, there's none of that here. I mean, you're basically finding media that's appropriate to telling a story, and then you just buy some iPads and put it on it and make sure that the people are trained well. But there's no, you know, there's no software, really, and it, it's all really about the human experience and, and training people how to interact and I think in a way that good tour guides should be doing even if they aren't using the iPad, but in some ways you're just reinforcing best practices of teaching in the tour guides. But you know, this is just like a letter rack here that they use as their iPad storage rack. And you know, they have a USB hub and they plug it all, they synchronize all the dozen iPads in one, uh, on one, uh, actually on the smart tablet that we bought to originally do the project. <laughs> So yeah, it's it's a pretty pretty simple setup. So we did we did all we did assessment through a checklist through a, a, a pre-training survey, a post-training survey, and you know really the the essential things that we learned is is training on the iPad and the apps up front before you get into training on the tour guides how to use them in the tour it was so key. When we looked at success rates. Uh, of docents that did tours and then continued to do tours, it was always the people that went to the Apple store first and then went through the training. The people that just came to the training and didn't go to the Apple store, they all dropped off. 
because they were overwhelmed. It was, it was too much for them. They had to have that comfort level with the device before being trained. Uh, it doesn't, I'm not saying you have to go to an Apple store. I think you could do the training in-house, but there has to be just this kind of, it, it's, you know, it, it's such a, uh, a tactile uh, experience using an, a, an iPad. If you haven't, you really need to kind of make it your friend <laughs> and be, uh, before you can do this. So comfort with the device, comfort with the content, uh, lots of observations so you start to understand how to do it. Practice and teaming. Uh, timing is essential. My, my daughter's a, a comedian and I learn a lot about timing from her and it's so true with this as well. Where, where you bring it in and when you bring it in is really important. And then the docents uh, have expressed, and we haven't done this yet, but we're going to, a real interest in getting together uh, every couple of months and just sharing experiences and learning best practices. Real quick, the, the big challenges are practice, maintaining the balance, and this is the, really the biggest thing we face right now is how to manage all the content. The docents have been so interested, they all go home and search and dig up all sorts of really cool stuff. Well, we're just overwhelmed with content. So how to, how to manage, manage that. So, and, and also docents wanting to bring their own personal iPads in, which you can just kind of imagine the challenges of trying to do something that has kind of museum standards and then bringing their own devices in. So there's, there's a book. There's a book. Grad student doing research, there's a book. <laughs> that it has a chapter that has a lot more about our research that Nancy Proctor edited. And if you want to learn more about it, you can go uh, get that AAM publication, which is an ebook. Thanks. Okay, everyone did so well on time. We actually have 10 minutes left for, time for questions. Liz. I have, um, it's just a, a very curious, and Scott, with the um, the just-in-time learning principles that are just you know that that has always been in teaching, and now using that with the media, does it, do they come to like is is there a pre-caching? Um, not not technically, but have they come to anticipate where those trigger points are going to be, and then do they discuss them with other? Um, does it become like a social kind of thing between, uh, amongst the docents so that they kind of like learn to anticipate and they kind of. Well, they want to do more of that, like I was saying with the sharing. But they do, they do find things in the and bring, come into the docent office and are all excited about this new video they found of this or that. Um, the big thing I think just to, is is that they really do need to. That you can't just. Ex I don't think any of them are good enough, and I certainly wouldn't be. To just say whatever's on the iPad, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pull up. You really still need to kind of think. There, here's the parameters of this tour, and there's these 12 things I may or may not use. Uh, so, I'm gonna. Does this? Oh, this does work. Okay. So my question for you, Scott, is you saying how you were surprised at the interest of the docents, and uh, just following up on your question, Liz. From the docent's perspective, did they just see this as another interpreted tool? Like I know um, when I worked at CLR museums, often they would show other pictures, or they have hands up, hand up, or you know, like you said, the beaver pose. Do they? Is this the modern day beaver pose? Yeah, it's the it? modern day. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's definitely it definitely is uh, is looked at that way. But I think we're trying to get them to look at it even beyond that. You know, certainly, if we, we a lot of the stuff, first stuff we digitized was the stuff they were carrying around in their hands. What's the longest range I've ever seen? Anybody? I might just be able to yeah. hold it like it's this. It's really, <laughs> it's really <laughs> simple. Um, I, I was wondering, um, along the same lines, when people are going on tours, like the visitors are going on tours, do you find um, that they are aware that tour guides will have the iPads? Is it something you know publicized? Do they wait? For the tour guide that has it, as opposed to the tour guide that doesn't. Mm, they've intentionally tried. They have. They've intentionally not done that. They don't want to make it about iPad tours. Uh, they really want to make it about tours because they don't want to diminish the, the tour guides that don't. The the, the use, use of the iPads is purely optional, and and I think that's the way it should be. You don't want to force somebody to have to use it. And but so they don't want to diminish the tours where you might have an absolutely expert docent who doesn't really, you know, isn't comfortable with that. We, so that people all line up for that. 
the docent does say at the very beginning of the tour, I'm going to be using an iPad. So you're going to maybe need to change your position once in a while so that you can see what I'm showing. Um, one of the things that I really like uh, what you said, Scott, about how um, you know the most interactive person or the most interactive device is the person, mm -hmm. and also that the docents um, really need to be good teachers um, more than users of the iPad, although that's important. Um, I'm wondering for the whole panel, um, what in, in the technology things that you've presented today, what's the like really quintessential technology piece that 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 really adds to it because for, for our use, it's, it's those two things, the person and the, uh, the, the facilitation, that's really key to the experience. What, what is the technology? I think that's a bad, bad question. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, no, the reason I think it's bad is because I, I think a lot of the technology we end up being easily distracted by. And, right. and frankly, that's, that's the crap reason to use any of it. It's not because like, oh my god, I need to have an iPad or, or I better use this multi-touch cell. It's, it's, it's really what's the experience that you're trying to get at, what's the content there, and then let that, that, let that appropriate experience emerge, right? I mean, we could have, even though we had really, let me, let me see if I can actually bullshit this answer, right? Um, you know, when we first started talking about the high wall, we always knew it was going to be a mobile application. I think very, from the very, I guess in the view of it, just the view path. Um, you know, well, for the most part, we talked about what the experience was long before we figured out the exact form factor or what the specific devices is going to be. And it was really, in, in the earliest discussions where you, you had an idea of when people to share and then we had a discussion about what do people do in the museum anyway, and we recognize that there are people that are coming with mobile devices, and so it actually lent itself pretty well that it was going to be a mobile experience. But I don't think there's any quintessential technology that's, that's perfect. Now, having said that and negated what I'm about to say, um, I would say that the, the thing that's interesting in particular with, with iPhone and iPads, and not because I'm an Apple fanboy by any stretch, but that, that none of the technologies that they represent are unique or new. They have all existed in one form or another. It's the complete packaging of those technologies in an incredibly sophisticated form factor, an incredibly rich supporting environment that really has opened up a whole new generation of possibilities and potential things. There's, there's no reason that, that, uh, that the stuff that Scott showed couldn't have been done on an iPad or any of the mobile stuff we did on any number of Dell, Axiom handhelds. Those were all shitty experiences, right? And now we're at a point where they're not anymore. And, 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 and it's because there's the potential of what those devices offer and because they elevate the overall experience to get rid of all the sucky parts or a lot of the sucky parts and make the baseline actually pretty good, that people can then leverage off of that and get to an even better spot. But it still requires a lot of careful attention to what the experience ought to be, what the experience should be. I guess that's the same thing again. Um, and then really what the content lends itself to. I guess for me, since my job at the museum is really about interpretation, I don't want to throw out any of the old ideas. I think the label on the wall is still a really good tool, right? I, I think the audio guide is still a really good tool. When we started thinking about this app, we started by thinking about audience. So there's a, a particular group of people who love to use their smartphone, and how can we reach them? And so, honestly, as a museum educator, I think it's really important to do what you said, start with the people, start with the information. And I still deliver content in a pretty wide range of ways, and I'm not prepared to get rid of any of those. I'm just happy to add another. Right, I mean, it seems like it will shine with that. Well, let me, let me at, at the, the expense of, of monopolizing this. There, Peter, Peter did a great project a couple years ago, and I can't think of what the exhibit is. Um, some exhibit that started with the B, but the basic premise was they had a, of, you know, that's how I remember stuff. The, the basic premise was that they had a bunch of different content in the galleries, audio, text panels, stuff on the walls, docent tours, and really what was what was the best form of delivery? And it turns out that, that there wasn't any one best form, and it really was you know about five different things. Yeah, it depends on the person, but they found that their optimal point was about five different methods of delivering the same thing really gave them the highest visitor satisfaction. Um, I actually have a semi-dull question for Emily, <laughs> um, which is, I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more depth about um, Wi-Fi saturation and coverage. Like, did you um, saturate the entire building given the difficulty of doing it there, or did you just target areas where you knew the app was going to be used, or um, sort of other? Initially, we the just dark? did where the app was going to be used. So we looked at the content that we had, and we had about 300 um, audio stops previously made that covered a variety of our collections. And so initially when we took this on, we just wanted to highlight those collections of those areas. But then, you know, through the beta testing, you know, it's 
it's a mobile device, you're walking around, you can easily be engaging with something and walking to walking outside the pocket, the bubble. So um, so shortly thereafter we saturated both buildings and we have a huge um, sculpture park too where like at the very end of the sculpture park there's we have a sculpture and it's really uh, that was like the hardest part to get coverage but um, but you can use your cell service as well but it was mostly for um, we were kind of vacillating between making sure that uh, there was either cell service or Wi-Fi for the iPods that we're distributing I mean, we, we have to consider both Yeah, we have time for one more question. So go Very for it. quickly, Julia. So, why did you decide to build an app rather than putting that money towards creating more audio content for your existing audio tour? I think it's really about the audience, Nancy. We felt like we had a really great product in that audio guide, and we know who that audience is. And I felt like, I think Pat felt like, we were satisfying that audience but there was a really major initiative at our museum to go for a younger audience and to find ways to engage those people in our museum. And this was one way we thought, and Pat, you may want to add to this. Yeah, Nancy, I think we found that young, young audiences were not picking up our audio guide. Um, I'm talking about people in their 20s. Um, they are using social media a lot. We wanted to experiment with whether or not that was a way we could engage with them and perhaps they could engage with each other. No, we're seeing that they're not engaging with each other that much. We're going to try some other ways to, to try to prompt that. May not happen. We don't know. But we wanted to move to another you know, format for that. Okay. Um, I think we're out of time. So, uh, But I think it's lunch break now, so we don't have to rush out of the room. So if people have questions, they can come up. And I'd like to thank everybody on the panel. And thank you.